there are four different types of energy we uh, differentiate. On the one hand, in the upper left hand side, there's the mechanical energy, then we have the electromechanical energy, the, the chemical energy on the lower left hand side, and finally the heat energy. And uh, there's of course always the possibility to transform the different energy forms or different energy types. Um, we can't destroy energy, we can just convert it into a different type. So, uh, for example, if we have uh, mechanical energy, we can transform this uh, type of energy to an electromechanical one by induction so that we move electrons uh, in a magnetic field, then we get electromechanical energy uh, current. And so you see there are different uh, transformation pathways. Uh, for example, the chemical energy, which uh, is bound in the molecules and the chemical bond, uh, what we can do is by combustion we get heat energy. So burning oil uh, in a boiler uh, gives us uh, heat energy. Um, starting from the chemical energy. And you see there are always uh, arrows or pathways uh, to change the type of energy to, from one form to another, for example, chemical energy to mechanical energy uh, by using the muscles. Um, so if you uh, do some sports or uh, lift a weight, uh, you transform the chemical energy uh, stored uh, uh, in your body uh, and transform it to mechanical energy. There are three different energy sources we differentiate. We have marked in green uh, the primary energy, then in blue the secondary energy, and finally on the right hand side in yellow uh, the useful energy. So starting with the uh, last one, the useful energy, um, there are three different types we differentiate. Um, so useful energy is the energy we, we use in our all day life. So mainly, uh, if we are talking about useful energy, it's uh, talk about electricity, so electric power we use. Then, of course, we have uh, the heat demand, um, which uh, is not only the, heat, the room heat or the hot water um, in a household, but also a process heat for industrial processes to, to get steel, for example. Um, and finally, of course, we have the energy demand uh, for the transportation sector, meaning going by car, by plane, by ship. So you need uh, fuel uh, to uh, to go by uh, by car. This is the type you use in the transportation sector. So on the left hand side, the primary energy sources we have to fulfill the useful energy demand um, is, uh, on the one hand, or are the fossil energy sources, um, starting with hard coal, then lignite, uh, or brown coal, light coal. Then we have, of course, uh, the oil, um, and finally the natural gas. So these are the big four fossil energy sources. Then, of course, we have the, uh, the nuclear energy, so using uranium in uh, a nuclear power plant, uh, and uh, getting electricity. Uh, and finally, the merging group of renewable energy sources, so hydropower, we have the wind, photovoltaics, bioenergy, geothermal energy. Um, so the first four sources are based on, this, on the sun, of course. Uh, photovoltaics, I think it's clear uh, that we use the sunlight to get electricity, but also the wind is driven by the sun. Uh, we heat the atmosphere at the surface uh, of Earth. And this drives the movement of the atmosphere, so we get wind, hydropower as well. Uh, we have the water, um, which drives our hydropower uh, plants, and of course, bioenergy growing of plants is based on photosynthesis and, of course, uh, based on the sun. And then, of course, the geothermal energy that's uh, coming from the inner core of, of Earth, so heat energy uh, we can use to, on the one hand, get heat. So, here on the right hand side, we have the useful energy, we have the geothermal energy, we can use it to heat up our homes and if you uh, take the geothermal energy from deep layers down uh, in Earth, uh, of course we can also generate electricity in a geothermal power plant. And so you see the, so uh, the pathways, uh, for example, if we have uh, the, the oil uh, as one uh, fossil energy source, then we can transform this to heating oil. Uh, and burn this uh, in a boiler at home to get heat. So we have these pathways. 
But what we have also to consider is that we have losses uh, on the one hand by transformation from one time to another and of course uh, due to transportation uh, for example the hard coal um, is uh, coming let's take an example of, of Germany uh, there are no hard coal mines anymore in Germany and uh, we get the hard coal from Australia from uh, Colombia from uh, Russia and this uh, hard coal is transported by a ship for example to Germany then we transform it to a secondary energy type uh, to coal and then again it's burned in our coal power plants to generate electricity and this transformation from coal to electricity of course we have uh, losses uh, due to the restrictions uh, in the efficiency of these systems. There are different energy units and conversion factors we need to consider if we're talking about uh, energy. Uh, on the one, of course, uh, the well-known metric prefixes. Uh, you can see here on the left-hand side, so kilo uh, 10 to the third, mega 10 to the six, giga 10 to the nine, tera 10 to the 12, peta 10 to the 15, and exa 10 to the 18. So these are the uh, metric prefixes uh, which occur often in the, the energy business. On the other end, of course, they are the uh, prefixes with um, milli, uh, nano, etc. Um, so, but they aren't um, uh, important for the energy uh, sector. Then, of course, uh, for example, keep this in mind: there are different uh, in different countries. There are different um, metrics used. For example, um, if you talk about the volume, one uh, cubic meter is one thousand liters. Uh, in the metric system, but uh, in particular, United States, they use uh, different uh, uh, metrics. Uh, so one U.S. gallon, for example, is 3.78 liters. Um, they also use yards instead of meters uh, for length. Um, so keep this in mind when we are talking about uh, energy units. Um, temperature, for example, typically we use uh, Kelvin, that's the uh, physical unit, but there's also, of course, the degree Celsius. In the United States, they use degrees Fahrenheit. So you need to be able to uh, convert the different uh, energy units. And finally, at the bottom, uh, you see a table with uh, four different uh, energy units. Of course, the uh, the SI unit Joule, that's the energy um, unit we should use uh, always. Um, the work done is uh, fourth times uh, the distance or the length um, and gives you the unit Joule. But uh, there are other units which have been used in the energy business um, depending on the country. So first let's talk about the, uh, this unit of watt hours. Um, a very useful unit in the energy business. So what we take is, uh, or what we know is that um, the um, energy is power times uh, time. So E is P times T. And the unit uh, of this uh, joule is watts times second. So one joule is one watt second. Uh, in the energy business, uh, we uh, typically don't talk about uh, seconds or minutes, but we are in the hour uh, interval. And that's a very helpful unit so that uh, the, the energy unit is what times hour, so what hours. And then we use this uh, uh, prefix mega, so uh, 1 million watt hours. Um, you will see that this is a very helpful unit. Um, of course, what you should do is make yourself familiar to transform this uh, joule to uh, uh, watt hours, uh, how to do this transformation as a joule is watt seconds, but we want to use uh, watt hours. Then there are two uh, other or two more units, TOE, tons of oil equivalent. So what is the amount of energy by burning one ton of oil uh, coming, of course, from the United States? So 
again, a very common, uh, the, the, this unit is very generally used in uh, publications coming from the United States, um, because the United States is an oil country and they use uh, this unit, so what is the energy amount, uh, the energy content of one ton of oil equivalent. Then uh, sometimes you will see this BTU, British Thermal Unit, uh, coming forth from, from Britain, and an older energy unit, but still in use sometimes you will see BTU, uh, British uh, Thermal Unit. And then finally, uh, I skipped this on the slide, a uh, unit coming uh, from, from Germany, or also an older one, uh, the coal unit. So what's the amount of one uh, a ton of, of coal, so the coal unit, the energy demand or the, the energy we get if you burn one kilogram of, uh, of, of, of coal and um, the abbreviation is SKE in, 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 in German, so that's uh, in German it's Stein Kohle Einheit so I said at the German unit because we are a coal country. Germany is a, is a coal country. So Steinkohle Einheit, it's a hard coal unit. And um, of course, you don't need to, to, to learn these uh, trans or conversion factors. Uh, just keep in mind that there are different units and you must be able to convert uh, one energy unit to another one. Um, mainly what you should do is uh, concentrate on megawatt hours or watt hours because that's uh, a unit which is very helpful. You will see this uh, in this course that watt hours is uh, a unit which can be used in different ways uh, and uh, so make yourself familiar with these uh, with these units. Let's talk about some selected energy indicators um, beginning with the electricity consumption so the electric power of a typical household for persons in Germany you see here uh, the units uh, which are used, so uh, a household with the four persons um, consumes uh, about 4,000, 4,400 kilowatt hours um, per year. So uh, think about this unit, what does this mean, uh, what hours, then um, to, to see what is the, on the one hand, the primary energy consumption. So that's the energy consumption of all sectors, the electricity sector, the heat sector, and the transportation sector. In 2017, this was 13.5 exajoule, or 3.8 petawatt hours. So um, just think about what do these uh, prefixes mean? Exa, 10 to the 18th, peta, watt hours, peta, 10 to the 15th. So make yourself Quickly familiar if this conversion is correct from exajoule to petawatt hours. Uh, what you see next is the electricity consumption in 2016 uh, in Germany 1.9 exajoule or 0.53 petawatt hours. So you see the the share the ratio is that in Germany we use uh, about 20% of our total energy is uh, the uh, electricity. If you take a look at the global uh, energy consumption, again, primary energy consumption, that's uh, again electricity, heat, and transportation sector, it's a 556 exajoule or 154.4 petawatt hours. So you see Germany, small country, but an industrial one. Um, so the share, we are, we are a small country, but we have a significant share uh, of the uh, global energy consumption. And Again, the uh, electricity consumption globally uh, nearly 90 exajoule or 25 petawatt hours. So you see, it's uh, more or less, um, yeah, 50% uh, of the energy demand is uh, electricity. And if you then take a look at the energy consumption per capita, you see this year for uh, 2014 uh, data taken from the World Bank. Um, you see um, what is one person living in Iceland, small island uh, in the uh, northern part of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, United States, Germany, China, India, and uh, South Sudan. So what is the energy consumption? So that means, again, primary energy consumption. Um, 
electricity, heat, and transportation sector. What you can see is, for example, starting with the United States, so one inhabitant from the United States is using nearly 7,000, um, and then keep this in mind, kilogram of oil equivalent. That's the unit, it's not watt hours. So you have to transform this unit to watt hours if you want to compare these values with the upper values. So close to 7,000 uh, kilograms of oil equivalent that's the energy uh, consumption of one inhabitant in the United States. Germany, or one uh, inhabitant from, from Germany, is just using one half. So the energy demand per capita is done just one half. In China, um, on the step from an emerging uh, to an uh, industrial country, again, one uh, person living in China consumes 2,200 uh, kilogram of oil equivalent, so again, uh, let's say one half of the uh, German energy consumption, but you have to keep in mind that's pro capita, so you have to multiply this value with the uh, uh, people living in China, uh, so the population and the one, uh, and the, this gives you the very large value of the uh, primary energy uh, demand of China. India, again, an emerging country, um, let's say one third of the energy demand of China, so you can compare these two countries and the, the industrial level of, of India has not the same, or it's not on the same level like uh, in China. And then finally the uh, South Sudan, so one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, so one um, person living in South Sudan and in Africa just consumes 66 kilograms of oil per year, so they mainly use uh, woodwork uh, for uh, for boiling, for heating, um, there is typically no uh, access to electricity and that uh, explains why this value is so small. And then finally, uh, one of the largest values of energy consumption per capita um, can be found in Iceland. So why is this uh, value so large? And uh, yeah, the reason is that uh, Iceland has a lot of energy, very cheap energy, uh, due to geothermal uh, energy, so Iceland is more or less a Vulcan, and uh, they can use in particular uh, these uh, geothermal energy to drive uh, their power plants. There are big industries, aluminium and steel, um, so energy is very, very cheap on Iceland, and that's important. It's a green energy, it's a renewable one uh, as geothermal energy. There are no uh, any uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If you take a look at the global primary energy consumption by different sources, um, you can see here in this diagram with uh, data from our world and data, um, you, you see the different types of um, uh, sources. We have coal, natural gas, and nuclear, crude oil as the fossil sources. We have the renewable ones like solar, like hydropower in blue, wind, uh, traditional biofuels, so meaning uh, woodwork, for example. Um, and then what we have a look at is we begin in the, with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in um, the beginning of the 19th century, go up to uh, today, and what you see is now how do the uh, sources change or the, the importance of the, of the sources. With the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you see here this uh, green uh, curve represents the, the biofuels, so this is biofuels. So, in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we used biofuels, woodwork, uh, to drive uh, the machines. And then, in the beginning of uh, the 19th century, so uh, 1850, uh, we start using coal, so the black line, that's mainly um, hard coal. So, that was a very efficient energy source uh, to drive the machines, uh, burn the coal uh, to, on the one hand, first get hot steam, and then the second step uh, later uh, to, uh, gen to drive uh, generators and, and drive turbines and generate electricity. And then uh, the next source is uh, the oil. So in grey, beginning of the 20th century, in very fast increase demand of or consumption of the crude oil in grey. So that's, uh, that's here, the oil. Again, a very efficient uh, energy source, um, high energy density. That's the reason why we use a lot of uh, oil uh, today, mainly, of course, on the transportation sector, but it's also used in other, other times. Um, 
then uh, the third fossil source is uh, natural gas beginning in the 1940s 1950s so after second world war uh, here in dark yellow that's the um, natural gas again a source which is very efficient uh, can easily grabbed and used in uh, gas power plants in uh, and of course to be burned uh, uh, in a turbine or to, to generate electricity or heat so that's uh, that's the natural gas natural gas and, and then what you see is here at the at the bottom uh, here in this in this part that's that are the renewables so in blue uh, hydropower starting in the 90. 60s, 1970s. You see, of course, here in dark red, that's a nuclear. So that, that's of course not a renewable energy source. Uh, but you see, compared to the fossil ones, uh, they can't contribute. They, the fossil ones still dominate the global uh, primary energy consumption. Of course, that's a problem uh, regarding uh, climate change because using these three sources generates a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, to heat up uh, the planet. And the renewables, uh, hydropower is the largest one with at the moment, yeah, let's say five uh, petawatt hours. But you see here at the very small bottom, you see that's wind, that's solar. Yeah, there is no uh, big share. Um, and of course, we need to change this and get rid of these fossil energy types uh, but that's the uh, situation we are facing at the moment. The energy use versus the GDP per capita can be seen in this figure. You see on the x-axis uh, the GDP, so the gross domestic project as a measure of the market value of, of all goods and services which have been produced in a country within one year and on the y-axis you see the energy use in megawatt hours per capita and each dot represents one country. Um, the data have been taken from our world in, in data. So let's start with uh, this orange dot of the United States. Over there you see the GDP of the United States is about 50,000 uh, 51 uh, to 52,000 US dollar per capita and the energy use per capita is about 80 megawatt hours. Oh, so the energy use uh, is of course the electricity, the heat demand and the transportation uh, sector demand of the whole country divided by the population. On the other hand, Germany for example has a slightly smaller GDP than the United States, about uh, uh, 42 to 43,000 US dollars uh, and an energy use which is close to 45 megawatt hours per capita. So smaller uh, energy use per capita um, and that's the reason why Germany is below this this dashed line you can see here. There are some extreme examples like Luxembourg uh, with a high GDP, a uh, small country in uh, Central Europe uh, and uh, GDP of uh, let's say same level than the United States. Qatar is the country with the highest GDP and the highest energy use due to they very cheap energy costs uh, due to uh, coming from the oil industry and uh, yeah that's a one extreme value. Uh, some emerging countries you can see here at the bottom you see all these small dots represent mainly uh, rather poor countries uh, in, in Africa. You see here China emerging country uh, on its way to, to an industrial level. You see the GDP per capita still uh, below far below the values of, of Germany or United States with, uh, let's say, 13,000 uh, US dollars per capita and an energy use of just uh, 35 uh, megawatt hours per capita. But keep in mind, you have to multiply this energy use per capita with the population and then you get a rather large one. India, uh, even uh, poorer than, than China, uh, smaller energy use per capita and as well a uh, smaller GDP. And you see here the dashed line represents um, the trend, uh, the average uh, that you can derive uh, the energy use uh, of a country uh, by knowing the GDP with this factor of 1.365 kilonauts per US dollar GDP. 
a long-term energy transition of uh, Germany, for example, uh, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1815 up to, to, to uh, today, uh, can be seen in this, uh, in this figure. Uh, you see here uh, the data provided from our Volta data shows how the energy uh, usage, the energy supply of Germany has changed within the last uh, two centuries. Uh, beginning uh, just before the Industrial Revolution, which started, uh, let's say, in the early uh, 1830s, 1840s uh, of the 19th, uh, 19th century in Germany, you see mainly Germany, the German energy system based on uh, fuel, ver fuel wood uh, in green and uh, muscles from human and animals. You see here this large share of uh, nearly 90%. Um, water and wind, of course, uh, not to produce electricity, but to, to drive uh, mills, for example, and just 10% uh, contribution was, was hard coal, you see in this black curve. And then you see the fast transition of the energy system. Within a couple of decades, uh, we got rid of, uh, nearly got rid of uh, animal and human muscles. You see here the uh, contribution, the share of hard coal increases up to 90, 80, 90 percent till the end of the 19th century. Um, then you see in grey, uh, oil is, uh, is starting to be used uh, after the Second World War. You see this small peak here between the First and the Second World War. Uh, and then, of course, um, important uh, energy uh, source is oil in Germany. You see this drop of this uh, crisis in the 1970s. And then you see natural gas is also contributing um, with a share of 30% uh, today. Um, and then you see here this uh, primary uh, electricity coming from here. What you see is there is still no uh, large share of wind or water. You see here, although we have a lot of wind turbines, um, installed in Germany with PV systems uh, with a total capacity of uh, nearly or more than 100 gigawatts, the contribution to the total of the primary energy supply is rather small because we have to keep in mind PV and wind just produce electricity, uh, but this is also uh, the contribution for uh, heat, process heat, and uh, industrial processes, etc. Uh, so the share is still. Are, are rather small. And what you can do is uh, on the website of our Molten Data, you can have a look at different countries uh, and the long term energy tr transition in, in other countries, which might be very interesting uh, to have a look at. One indicator to decide what is the industrial level of a country is the share of the population with access to electricity. What you can see here on the slides are different countries with a large population like uh, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, uh, Nigeria, for example. And the share uh, shown in these uh, bars in green, the share in the 1990s, and uh, the share in 2016 shown in, in blue. The data, is, uh, the data has been taken from the World Bank. What you can see is here that all these countries have shown an increase of the uh, access to electricity, like India, from 70 up to 92%. So 92% of the population in India has now access to electricity, which gives the country the, the chance to step uh, to a higher industrial level. You see also many African countries like Congo or the Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, Kenya, they nearly doubled their share from 30 to uh, 62 percent, for example, in Kenya. And that's one main issue um, on the development of, of countries. In Europe, we have uh, terminated this development, 100 percent of the population has access to electricity, but this has been done in the past, in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, um, as one important step. And these countries are on their way uh, to a higher industrial level. So what will be the future of the energy demand in different regions of the world? What you can see in this figure uh, with data from the International Energy Agency and the, the World Energy Outlook 2016, you see um, the past and the future of the energy demand. See here today, the situation 2020, and then within the next two decades, where will we go? And what was the past? The unit uh, of this energy demand is in megatons of oil equivalent. So you see, uh, on the one hand, uh, 
the well-established industrial regions like North America, Europe, um, Japan, Korea, they are on a constant level and there's nearly no decrease of energy demand, so we'll keep on a high level. Um, you see a very fast increase uh, in Asia, China, India, uh, they will double their, uh, their energy demand and they will drive the global energy demand. So that in 2040 will increase the energy demand to uh, nearly or uh, more than 70 gigatons of oil equivalent, uh, starting from 14 gigatons of oil equivalent today. Uh, and of course, that's one uh, issue we have to handle within the next years, uh, that of course the energy demand must be fulfilled with renewable energy systems and not by uh, fossil ones. The development of the power plant capacity, uh, for example, here in, in, in Germany, uh, can be seen on this figure. Uh, you see uh, the different years, starting in the year 2002, uh, up to now, what is the power plant capacity with data provided by the Fraunhofer Easy on the website energy charts.de. You see the capacity uh, in, in gigawatts. You see how the uh, energy system is transformed and is transforming as well. You see, starting in the beginning of the of this uh, decades, uh, you see we have a lot of coal and nuclear power, starting with 100 gigawatts of capacity, and then you see uh, this increase of this light blue color wind and, in particular, yellow solar systems. So we have installed a lot of new systems uh, of renewable systems uh, in Germany. And if you see where are we now, uh, you see the capacity at the moment in Germany is close to 220 gigawatts. So we have more than doubled the capacity of our power plants with a slight reduction of uh, fossil resources, coal, hard coal, uh, lignite, um, nuclear power, of course, and a significant increase of uh, onshore wind in light blue. This darker blue color is uh, offshore wind so uh, wind turbines installed in the sea and uh, PV systems which have a total capacity uh, of about 100 gigawatts in, in Germany today. If you take a look at the, uh, the net electricity production of the energy systems we have in Germany, um, we'll first have a look at the situation in the year 2002 in Germany uh, with the data again provided by the firm of ESA. So um, in the beginning of uh, the year 2002, we haven't had a lot of uh, renewable energy systems, so the uh, system was, uh, well, the energy was produced by nuclear power, by brown coal, lignite, and by hard coal, so that's, that's the dominating, that are the dominating sources, um, a small part of, of natural gas. There have been some uh, wind turbines installed on shore with a small share, and of course hydropower. But you see then, in the year 2019, the situation has uh, significantly changed. Um, we see a drop of the energy production of uh, nuclear power uh, due to the demolishing and uh, the shutdown of nuclear power in Germany. Uh, the lignite is still on a very high level. Hard coal has also halved their uh, the production. Uh, and what you see is a significant increase of renewable energy, in particular biomass, uh, solar and wind, of course. So, due to the installation of about 100 gigawatts of uh, wind and uh, PV capacity, uh, wind and uh, solar systems contribute about uh, 30 up to 40 percent of the electric production share. Uh, and that's a very good uh, way of uh, the transformation of the German energy system. We need to define different types of, of power plants. So, what's the, what, what are the differences of the power plants we are using uh, in a modern energy system? What you can see here at the top: uh, base load power plants like nuclear power, lignite, uh, with a utilization time of uh, six thousand to seven thousand hours per year. See on the right hand side a picture of the former nuclear power plant in, in Germany. Uh, so they are contributing to the base load, so the, the energy demand which occurs day and night, uh, Sunday, Saturday uh, and, and on the working days. Then second type are the medium, uh, the, the medium load power plants, large, uh, like hard coal fired power plants or 
oil and some of the gas fired power plants with an uh, operation time of 3000 up to 5000 hours a year. See here on the right hand side a coal power plant or a picture of a coal power plant. Um, they uh, on the one hand have a lot of operating hours per year uh, but they are responsible for the frequent load changes which occur over several minutes um, in a country um, so they are able to increase and decrease the output within a short time scale. Then we have the peak load power plants, uh, mainly gas turbines, and then we have this uh, pump storage power plants you can see on the right hand side with a utilization time of just 1000 hours per year. Um, so what they do is they start up and shut down several times a day uh, with just a short time intervals uh, running. Uh, so if there's a fast change in the energy demand within in, in minutes or even seconds, they can fulfill this demand very fast and they are very flexible. And finally, what we are getting more and more, what the contribution is getting uh, larger, are the volatile energy systems like wind and photovoltaics. On the right hand side, you see here this uh, ground mounted PV system. Uh, of course, they depend on, on weather conditions, uh, the wind speed, uh, the radiance. And so, of course, they can only be switched off or turned down. You can't uh, change the outcome uh, of wind turbines and PV systems that fast and that easy. Um, so, uh, they of course, just disturb uh, the system because on the one hand you have the load, then you have this volatile energy systems and the other systems have to um, adopt to this, uh, to this load and to this volatile energy systems. One important uh, key indicator uh, in the energy technology is uh, are full load hours. Uh, so what's the definition of uh, full load hours or FLH? Um, so the full load hours is the result of a quotient of the generated electricity of the system and uh, the capacity or the rated output of a power plant. Uh, and the unit, of course, is time. So we have energy over uh, power and this gives us uh, time. Um, this is one important uh, indicator because that gives you information um, about how long or what's the time at all of a system running with full power. Um, so what you do is you differentiate just between two states uh, of an uh, energy system. So we have the time uh, and uh, we have the state of operation and the full and hours give you the information we have just 100%. So how long does the system operate at 100% and then uh, turned off so at 0%. And uh, this value here, the hours or seconds, gives you this is a bit of uh, the full load hours. Um, to be the interval is hours, so in one year we have 8760 hours, and uh, the full load hours give you, give you the share. And this rectangle that's, that's the energy produced of the system. Of course, a, a system, a power plant, is running on. A, different states, not only uh, on and off or zero and 100%, but this value just reduces the complexity uh, of a power plant in two states. And then you are able to compare different um, power plants by uh, comparing the full load hours. So let's make a quick example. Let's think about we have a coal fired power plant with a capacity of 300 megawatts and uh, the annual energy generated is uh, 1.2 terawatt hours. So the question is, what are the full load hours of the system? So what you should do is just make a quick break of this uh, movie and uh, think for yourself what is what is the result. So let's just use this uh, equation we have here defined. So the full load hours are the energy. So the annual energy produced is 1.2 terawatt hours over the capacity 300 megawatts. So what we now need to do is we need to transform uh, this uh, terawatt hours to a uh, more appropriate unit. So uh, let's let's use megawatt hours. So that's 1,200,000 megawatt hours over 300 megawatts capacity. Now you see why. Uh, the energy unit of uh, megawatt hours is so useful in the energy business because now you can directly derive uh, uh, 
the time or the full hours because that gives you uh, 4,000 hours. So the system is running in this example for 4,000 hours with a maximum capacity of 300 megawatts. So let's make a quick sketch. We have the time. That's again the year 8,760 hours. Um, we have here is 4,000. Here we have the power on the y-axis. That's uh, 300 megawatts. And what we now have is that the system is running on this level 300 megawatts for 4,000 hours. And then it stops running and is set offline. So there's no energy production anymore for 4,760 hours. And uh, this marked rectangle that gives you the, uh, the energy and the energy is uh, 1.2 terawatt hours.